Video games are made up of hundreds, thousands, even millions of lines of code. And it's quite common for random things to happen in games, things that you didn't quite expect. And it's even more common for players to find a way to break your game. And when they do, you get a chance as a game development company to show who you really are. So let's discuss what you can do when players break your game, and how it can be a brilliant opportunity to connect with the player base. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Josh Strife Hayes. I love it when gamers find ways to do things in games that they weren't meant to be able to do. Unintended consequences. To beat a game in a strange way. And people on YouTube love it as well. We've got entire channels dedicated to showing how to beat Mario without jumping, or beat The Legend of Zelda by staring at a rupee for several hours. Most of these channels focus on glitches, and most of them are absolutely spiffing. But what I want to focus on is the unique opportunity afforded to game developers when someone breaks your game. Because when players break your game, you get a unique chance to respond to them. Let's discuss. Before we begin, consider dropping a like on the video or subscribing to the channel for more gaming stuff. Ring the bell for all the future notifications. And a massive thank you to all the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who keep the channel going. More on how you can support at the end. For now, let's begin. Sometimes games do unintended things that become major parts of the game. Let's take Space Invaders, an absolute classic. If you've played, you'll know the aliens move slowly at first, pacing back and forth across the sky and then moving down closer to you. And they speed up as you kill more of them. Now, you'd assume the speed up was an intentional game mechanic designed to add a progressive difficulty curve, but actually it was a bug. The older hardware simply couldn't render all the aliens at top speed. More sprites on the screen slowed things down, and as the sprites died, the game sped up, creating an unintended difficulty spike. As hardware advanced, game developers could have taken that curve out, but players loved the speed-up mechanic, so it was kept in, and became Space Invaders as we know it today. That's an example of hardware limitation creating an actual in-game gameplay mechanic that players resonated with and wanted to keep. But what about when players focus on what you would consider the wrong part of your game? What if players spend more time doing something in the game that you thought was just a side quest? Should you switch and make that part of your main gameplay mechanic and main gameplay loop? History says yes. When the original Grand Theft Auto was being beta tested, it was a simple top-down adventure game about being a criminal. You followed a story, but there was a small in-game mechanic to make sure you didn't break too many laws or kill too many people. If you broke the in-game rules, the police would chase you down and arrest you. This was meant to happen quickly so the player could return to the story faster, and the developers assumed it was a punishment. But beta testing found the exact opposite. Players often ignored the story and spent more time committing crimes and then running away from the police because it was a fun mechanic. Now, if players are enjoying your game, you've clearly done something right as a developer. But if they're enjoying part of the game in a way you didn't expect, you have a choice. Either remove it because the player is having fun wrong, or embrace it and double down. Listen to the player feedback and make this part the most fun it could be, even if it wasn't your original intention. Sometimes things happen in-game that aren't anything to do with hardware or player choice, they're just straight-up bugs, but they become so loved by the player base over time they start to be seen as features. If you played RuneScape back in the day, you probably followed someone while they're also following you, resulting in this strange square box step dance. This wasn't meant to happen. This was an unintentional result of two players following each other and the pathfinding trying to correct itself. But it became iconic. Then years later, when RuneScape was updated, they updated the pathfinding system and this bug was fixed. And players hated it. They wanted the box step back. So Jagex had to actually find a way to program in and recreate an unintentional bug because it had become part of the gaming culture. Players had done something the game makers didn't intend, and it was now part of the game, whether they liked it or not. RuneScape's actually full of little quirks like this. When they made old school RuneScape, they didn't have the ability to edit the overworld that was already there. So when they created the minigame The Nightmare Zone north of Yanil, a cow would randomly wander into the pen, because they couldn't stop it doing that. To pay homage to this small error, a cow just randomly spawns inside the actual minigame every now and again. But that's software limitation. What happens when players actively break the experience you've given them? Well, this is great, because now you have an opportunity as a game development company to show who you really are, to respond to the players, to start that beautiful dance, that tug of war between developer and player. 
This is The Witcher 3, one of my personal favourite games, and when it released, players quickly realised you could make a lot of money very quickly by killing cows in the starting area, collecting and selling the hide, then sleeping so they respawned. You'd make so much money so quickly you could either buy better equipment and make the rest of the game trivially easy or dominate all the Gwent matches. This clearly wasn't the intended gameplay path. Now, The Witcher 3 is an offline single-player game. You weren't harming any other player by abusing this unintended design, so the company didn't have to do anything with it. But this is the moment companies can show who they are. When players find an unintended design, a company has a choice. Leave it alone and let players keep doing it, or change it. And if they choose to change it, they have another choice. Remove it and return it to what the company intended it to be, essentially erasing the exploit ever existing and hoping the memory of it dies without much fanfare, or embrace what the players have discovered and respond to them with something new. If companies want to just update games and remove exploits, that's fine, but they're missing a huge opportunity to connect with the player base if they do that. Games design is a constant dance between players and designers finding a way to mess with each other. In The Witcher 3's case, they decided to mess with the players. If you kill too many cows in a short time, you summon the incredibly tough bovine defense force, a huge mutated bull who will absolutely wreck you. Now you can kill it, it doesn't drop much, it's just in the game to mess with players abusing the cowhide mechanic. This is a beautiful example of how a developer can respond to the player base of its game. They acknowledge the players found an unintended mechanic, and instead of erasing history with a boring update or a patch or a hidden game change, they add in something that rewards the players for finding it. The bovine defense force is part of Witcher 3 Urban Legend, and maybe one day an unintentional new player will kill some cows and get destroyed by it. Go online, Google, and discover the history behind it. This relationship between games developers and games players has been around for years, and some of the best gaming stories come from times the devs have responded to the players with cheeky smiles and unintended consequences of their own. When Tomb Raider 1 became a global success, word spread of a naked Lara cheat code spreading around the playground in hushed whispers and declaration of it's true my uncle works for PlayStation. Everyone was convinced they knew how to do it. So when Tomb Raider 2 released, Core Design made sure to spread the naked Lara code everywhere. They printed it in every gaming magazine they could find because they knew people wanted it. And when you put the naked Lara code into the game by jumping and flipping in just the right order, Lara exploded. That's an example of a company being completely self-aware. Another great one is RuneScape for programming quests if you're already carrying all the items you need to complete a quest. For example, Doric's quest. It's a really short, simple quest. You can finish it in a few minutes, but many players started saving time by starting the quest already carrying all the items they knew they would need so they could hand them straight in. Jagex became wise to this, and they added in hidden dialogue that would only trigger if you were carrying the exact items you already needed to hand the quest in. Players wanted to speedrun the quest, Jagex became wise to this, so they added a little nod to the player base, essentially saying, we know you're doing this, that's fine. The back and forth of game design. Gaming companies are just made up of people, and if you're lucky, it's people with a sense of humor. Now, if the game company is smaller, the people making the decisions, the executives, are likely to also be connected to the day-to-day -day creation of the game and understand the culture behind the game. Like the developer of Cluster Truck, messing with live Twitch streamers and changing their game as they were playing. The one issue we face then is what happens when you're playing a multiplayer game or an online game and a small group of players is exploiting and it's actually affecting the fun of the rest of the player base. That's when you need to change something, but it doesn't mean you need to go fully draconian. There is a fine line to be found and a line to be walked where you can manipulate and fix your game, but also pay homage to those who broke it. A friend of mine told me a story of him and a group of friends managing to glitch under the floor in World of Warcraft and travelling to the Alliance capital and killing other players using line-of-sight spells while they were completely invincible due to being hidden. And while they were doing this, a games master turned up. Now, they were clearly breaking the rules and ruining someone else's fun, so this had to be dealt with. But how it gets dealt with is a chance for the games master themselves and for the company they represent to form a bond and create a memory with the rules breaker. They can't let them get away with it, but they can also make a memory. They could just ban them, patch the floor abuse glitch and move on and be done with it, but Chris tells a different story. The GM told them they were in trouble. Then it turned them all into giraffes and teleported them deep into the ocean so they all drowned and died and had to resurrect inside enemy territory, taking res sickness and being in a dangerous place. 
Then they patch the bug. This is where online games differ from single player games. When an exploit is found inside a multiplayer game, an unintended design that makes the experience less fun for other players without their consent, it does need to be fixed. When players found a way to cast a turn 2 Emrakul in Magic the Gathering, a creature basically guaranteed to win you the game, they banned the combination of cards able to do that. Games designers do need to curate their games to a degree when exploits are found in multiplayer situations, but it's the nature of this curation that I'm interested in. Now any creative process is more art than science, so there's no hard and fast line of exactly where you need to switch from manipulating players or rewarding them to punishing them and changing the rules. But you need to make sure that you are rewarding intelligence. For example, I run Dungeons & Dragons games a lot, and if my party is about to take on a dragon and they have prepared, they have brought anti-dragon potions, anti-dragon weapons, they have set a trap, I will not change the difficulty of the encounter. I will allow them to use the advantage they've built up for themselves through their own intelligence, through their own preparation. But if they've been metagaming, if they've read the adventure ahead of time and know exactly what to do, then I will find a way to negatively reinforce this. I will use irony. Maybe the dragon won't be in the same place. Maybe it will be a different type of dragon. You need to make sure that you aren't taking away the advantage that clever and resourceful players give themselves while you're also limiting the advantage that exploiters are giving themselves. It's a fine line to walk. One way to do it really well is through the use of irony. Punishing players with irony is a brilliant way to acknowledge faults or flaws in your game or undiscovered unintended mechanics and then enhance the mythos of your own game with cultural relevance. It's how urban legends are born. Players discover something, devs fight back with humorous self-awareness. Like how if you play a pirated copy of Game Dev Tycoon, halfway into the game you'll start losing massive amounts of money because other people in the game start pirating your games and you can't keep up. What a wonderfully ironic punishment. As a game developer, you make the game, and then players will exist in and shape the game. And player actions can often become bigger or more culturally recognised parts of the game history than anything you intended, like Leroy Jenkins charging in, more dots, many whelps handle it, Juriel 321 and the Falador Massacre, or Lalafels being known as potatoes. The players will create situations in your game that shapes the game. And you can take those situations and use them as building blocks for fleshed out, real world inspired lore. You can mould them into an in-game experience like The Witcher 3 with the Bovine Defence Force. You can embrace the player choice of your minor mechanic like Grand Theft Auto with the police. You can find success in limitation and let it inspire you like the speeding up of Space Invaders. If you make a game, players will eventually find unintended consequences within it, or they will completely break it. That's going to happen. It's inevitable. And when it does happen, you get to show what kind of developer you are. Are you going to fix it quietly in a patch that never gets mentioned again and hope it gets forgotten? Or are you going to create gaming culture? Are you going to create an urban legend? Are you going to start that wonderful dance with players back and forth? Are you going to say, I see what you did there. Now try this on for size. When a player breaks your game, they're giving you a chance to make history. Take that chance and run with it. Make Lara explode. Put the square follow dance back in. Have Psycho Mantis read the memory card. Let the giant in Skyrim smash you into the sky and have an NPC reference this. Do something that lets the player base know you're one of them. Let them know they are seen and that you want them to have fun in your game and they're not having fun wrong. When a player breaks the game, say thank you then break it right back and give them more game. Thanks for watching. Another massive thank you to the Patreon supporters and Twitch subs who keep the channel alive. You can support from only £1 a month. Check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter and our Discord. And as always, have a great day.